oral health and hormones? Yes. Changes with hormones can affect your smile. I don't know about you, but the one thing I would love to have and so appreciate is a brighter smile. I got a mouthful from my guest, and yes, I couldn't wait to say that. If you think, I've got a dentist, I've got great teeth, I don't, I don't need to hear this, don't go away just yet, stay put. Seriously, you're going to find some answers to questions, I'm going to guess, you didn't know to ask in this episode. I ask about the best and the worst toothpaste. We discuss the anatomy of a toothbrush and wait for it at the very end. So stick around. I ask if you could heal a cavity naturally. You're going to want to hear the answer to all of these and so many more questions like say about flossing. Anybody want to hear that on this episode? I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns. I share what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset so that you can change how you move and what you eat to have the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. And look, you know, usually when I'm thinking above the shoulders, I'm talking about mindset. But today we're talking about oral health and we're doing it for one reason. One very good reason, if you want to know the truth. A friend of mine was at a business meeting with me and we rode to the airport together. And in fact, we're in the same wing of the hotel or of the airport waiting for our respective planes. When it dawned on me, this is something my audience needs. So sometimes the best things are happy accidents. And I am so happy to introduce you today to Dr. Sanda Maldivan, double board certified periodontist and nutritionist. She practices biological dentistry in Beverly Hills. Her philosophy is that personalized nutrition combined with biological dentistry and at-home natural dental care play a pivotal role in chronic disease prevention. We're not just talking about in your smile. We're talking about it all. So we dive into how is it related to every other part of you and why that's so true. So I can't wait to dive in. Let's do it. Sanda, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, Deborah. I can't wait to chat about oral health. <laughs> right. <laughs> Although based on the title, every woman listening is slapping her head thinking, are you kidding me? There's more changes that come because of hormones. <laughs> right. <laughs> so first things first, though, I want to ask you, what is, will you define this? What is a biological dentistry and how is it different than what many of us might have grown up with? That's a great question. Really as a biological dentist and periodontist, what I do, we look at the toxins that are maybe silently living in the mouth, such as bone infections, gum disease, uh, mercury fillings, and we help to remove them safely so we can be better in our bodies. Great answer. Okay. So I want to talk about this because this was, it's been, it's been a minute since we've had a dentist. So I'm so glad you're here. And this was back probably 15 years ago and I was doing a radio show with someone and we first began to know and hear about, it became mainstream, that there was a correlation between oral health and risk of diseases. Can you speak into that a little bit? Absolutely. Well, what we know as biological dentists is that the mouth is connected with the rest of the body. And really, the mouth is the gateway to our health. And uh, things like chronic infections, for example, root canals, can affect that particular meridian, that energetic meridian. So 
As a meridian, just to give you an overview, it passes from the top of the head, through the teeth, and through the rest of the body, some organs, and all the way to the bottom of the feet. And uh, it's been well documented, for example, that women that have breast cancer typically have an infection in one of the premolar teeth or some of the smaller teeth in front of the molars. That's what premolars are. Uh, in a study done of 300 women, pretty much that had breast cancer, pretty much every single one of them had a root canal in that particular meridian. So, infections in the mouth affect the bodies in different ways. So also, mercury, just to talk about that um, as a toxin in the mouth, can affect someone in giving them irregular heartbeats. And also high mercury toxicity in the body, which can cause like brain fog, um, inflammation, uh, more propensity to have yeast infections, for example. So uh, it all matters. Got it. So talk about the severity, because we kind of opened this up, talk about the severity of mercury toxicity. And, and I'm curious, so we're talking about the old silver fillings. Are you still seeing a uh, a high number of those? Unfortunately, we are seeing a high number of mercury fillings. In the United States, uh, mercury fillings are still being placed. And what do we mean by mercury fillings? If somebody was to look in the mirror, look in your mouth, you'd see the silver fillings or silver colored or metal fillings. Those metal fillings typically have about 50% mercury. Uh, When we're chewing or we're drinking hot water or brushing our teeth and particularly over the filling, vapors of mercury come off and those vapors get ingested. And our body is very smart. It takes this mercury and puts it in the fatty tissues because it doesn't want it circulating in the blood. So um, slowly people will notice, you know what, I can no longer lose weight because Mm. The body doesn't want to let go of fat that's toxic. It wants to keep it away so that it doesn't end up back in the bloodstream. But yeah, mercury is a huge problem. Um, We're seeing still a lot of it. And the important thing is to have it removed safely. Uh, We call it a smart removal. And whoever's looking to have their mercury fillings removed is actually more dangerous to when we cut into them than when they're in the mouth. So for that reason... Um, our association developed a special way to remove these mercury fillings so that we don't end up inhaling. And not just you as a patient, but also me as a doctor, I can also end up inhaling a lot of this mercury vapor coming off when we're cutting into it. So uh, the smart removal uh, technique really helps us stay healthy, both from the assistant, doctor perspective, and the patient. So look for a doctor that's smart removal certified. Mm, Great tip. Great tip. So something you just said may make a woman say, well, should I just leave them in? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, How do we know that? So the first thing I would say, get a test. And what's the best way to test for mercury toxicity is a urine challenge test. Uh, mainly, uh, you have to go to a naturopath or a physician. Uh, they'll uh, give you an IV to help remove some of the mercury and the fat. And then you go home and collect urine over a six-hour period. And you send a little sample into the lab. And then we find out how toxic or how much the mercury uh, was sitting in the, in the fatty tissues. And it's not just mercury that is being tested. It's also lead, aluminum, cadmium. Um, and based on this, you can decide, wow, you know, I have a really high level of mercury in my body. Maybe it's time for me to remove these fillings. If you don't have high toxicity of mercury, maybe you're a good detoxifier. You have great genes and your body removes the mercury safely. Unfortunately, that's not most of us. Most of us have a genetic uh, mutation that, that doesn't allow us to really detoxify from mercury. And I'm talking about MTHFR gene. Um, So it's a great way uh, to find out is by testing. And if you're highly toxic, I would say definitely have your mercury fillings removed. 
Great tips. Okay. Love that. And I just want to go back for listeners and emphasize again, you know, you're doing all the right things. And by that, I want to acknowledge the fact that hopefully you're modifying your exercise so that you, yes, are exercising, but you're not going for that more. You're modifying it. So it is the kind that is that sweet space between too much and too little that is just right for you based on your hormonal status, your energy level, all the signs and the symptoms other than the scale that are there. You're doing those things. You're modifying your diet Again, with intelligence that we have in 2022, not what you learned in 1980, Mm -hmm. and and you're struggling with weight loss, this may be another area to look into. We've talked here before about toxins stored in fat and why that makes your body reluctant to release that fat because it's protecting you essentially. But you know, looking to your mouth and cavities and what you may want to consider as an avenue that you hadn't before. I love the insight that you're providing. So yeah, uh, to turn things up on a more positive note, (laughs) I would love to tap into what can we do just for optimal oral health? Because I think we all want you know, all, we want a bright smile. We want uh, to feel confident smiling. We want to feel confident about our breath. I mean, there are so many reasons why, you know, not to fear a dentist. <laughs> so yeah. I want to paint you in a positive light here. So um, I'm going to let you be the heroine and tell us what should we be really doing? What does optimal oral health look like in 2022 and beyond? This is a topic that I love to talk about, Deborah, because um, people can do so much from home. And um, my YouTube channel, uh, Ask Dr. Sanda, I actually go over things that you can at home reverse gum disease, for example, reverse bad breath um, by doing three simple things. Brush, use a water flosser, and a chewable probiotic. So by using this three-step method, what we're doing is not just, you know, cleaning the plaque, but we also want to build a healthy level of bacteria because that's what's going to give us the fresh breath. Uh, We have research that shows that uh, probiotics for oral health uh, will uh, decrease the amount of cavities, will decrease the amount of gum disease. Um, so what I found in my practice over the last 20 years is that using this three steps of brushing, water flossing, and a chewable probiotic really gives us the best long-term decrease in inflammation and decrease in cavities. Love it. Okay. So we've got that. And I'm going to come back to that because I've got a question for you that uh, listeners, you have to stick around to the end because I'm going to ask her some really juicy things. We're going to get specific care. Let's dive in a little bit to brushing. What should we be brushing with? I mean, I liken toothpaste to like staring at yogurts. I mean, there's just dozens. I mean, what what is really <laughs> what we want? <laughs> Great question. And I say it's the technique. It's not really the tool. Um, you definitely don't want to use a large toothbrush because a large toothbrush head, though, it, it's going to be hard to get around the corners. And especially people that have crowding, a smaller toothbrush head is better. The important thing, however, is to point the bristles of the brush into the gum not just on the tooth. And I think a lot of people make this mistake and it's very, very important to point the brush into the gums. But I hear, yeah, but when I do that, my gums bleed. Okay, because you're actually cleaning where you need to clean. You haven't done it that way. So plaque is accumulating at the gum line. That's where it typically likes to sit. And using like a small uh, circular motion is a great way to kind of sweep the plaque from under the gum out because we do want to brush slightly under the gum. Um, And for that reason, I like bristles that are very, very fine right at the tip of them. So um, um, disclosure, I have a natural oral product line, and I'm very particular about uh, the anatomy of a toothbrush. 
<laughs> because <laughs> because what works is really really fine bristles, not the hard ones that actually can go under the gum and sweep out the plaque. Wow. Okay. So fine and soft or by definition is fine soft because it's so thin. Uh, yeah, good question. Soft is a good uh, way to brush for sure. You, you don't need the hard bristles at all, okay. especially for people with thinner gums and that already have some recession. You can actually do more harm with using uh, really hard toothbrushes. Uh, electric brushes are okay too. Uh, I see some people though that don't do well with electric brushes. So then I have them switch or alternate between electric and a manual brush uh, because, uh, you know, they say, oh, an electric brush, you just leave it there and it does the work. Not really. You have to point it in the right direction. <laughs> so, There's so, no yeah. GPS in there, huh? <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> the other thing that I like, and you might see on the market, some of the bristles now are infused with charcoal. And I love charcoal, speaking of toothpaste. I love charcoal, except it gets very messy because it's black. And I don't know if you've ever used charcoal toothpaste paste, but it can get all over your sink and it's really hard to clean. So I don't, I'm not a big fan of, of, of that, but when we infuse charcoal in the bristles, we know that what we're doing is changing the uh, negative, the ions on the bristles. So it actually attracts more plaque. So you can brush without using toothpaste. But really? also we like toothpaste just for flavor, you know, it, it just feels better in terms of having that fresh minty breath after brushing. But yeah. Wow. Okay. So if, if a woman right now were quizzed to go get the toothpaste from her drawer and tell <laughs> us what she's using, who, who might be eliminated in the first round <laughs> from the island and booted off? Or, I mean, what is really what we want or is anything potentially harmful? Uh, I prefer a natural Tooth, uh, toothpaste. The reason being, I feel like there's so many of the chemical-based toothpaste uh, that can create more harm. For example, Crest had a toothpaste out there with plastic beads on the market. People actually got abscesses from that because they would remain stuck underneath the gum. They actually took it off the market. Uh, so anything with plastic beads, um, things that, for example, have um, chlorhexidine. Uh, there are a couple of toothpaste brands out there with chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine is an antibacterial, but it's also a pesticide. They use it on the field. So I'm not a fan of chlorhexidine in the toothpaste. Uh, triclosan is also one that was in toothpaste. Triclosan was actually taken out uh, for soaps off the market, but they left it in the toothpaste, which to me makes absolutely no sense because triclosan is toxic. So I would definitely not get a toothpaste with these kind of ingredients. Choose a more natural toothpaste. I'm fine with essential oils. Um, be a little bit careful with the tea tree oil because tea tree oil is very, very strong. Um, you know, a few years ago, I was experimenting with it and it basically killed off all my microbiome, all my healthy bacteria. And I ended up getting ulcers on my gums from using too strong of a tea tree oil. Mm -hmm. uh, toothpaste. So we also have to be careful with them, um, with the natural things. What um, about coconut oil? Uh, coconut oil is great. Um, some people use that for brushing and that's fine. It's a little bit of a different feeling because it's mm -hmm. oily. Um, I get a lot of questions about oil pulling, oh, you know, is oil pulling yeah. good for me? Mm -hmm. And coconut oil is one of those oils that are used for that. Um, uh, yes, it can be good in terms of cleaning off the plaque because it has antibacterial properties. However, in the 20 minutes that it takes to do oil pulling correctly, you can actually get better results using a water flosser uh, because it goes deeper under the gum that oil pulling does and in between the teeth. So we get better results long term in 90 seconds than 20 minutes with oil pulling. So I don't know about you, Deborah, but I don't have a lot of time in the bathroom <laughs> in the morning or at night. So, so I like to be really efficient with my time. Well, and I find the times I have tried 
coconut oil it pulling. I just find I want to spit. I just want it out of my <laughs> mouth way too soon. I was like, oh, is this really helpful at all? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. You know what happens <laughs> actually when you swish oil back and forth? The reason why the 20 minutes is essential is because the oil turns into a soap after 20 minutes of swishing. And it's mm. so we have to do it for that amount of time because you need the soap effect to clean the plaque. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we got our toothbrush. We've got our toothpaste. You got to talk to me. I love that you you answered a question I had earlier about the water flosser. So talk to me about regular floss. Asking for a friend. Do we really need to do that? Great question. And you know, everybody's mouth is so different. And especially now people, you know, since we're, we have dental implants, we have a lot of people that have dental implants and string floss does not work for dental implants. It works for teeth, uh, but we find that a water floss is about 80 times more effective or, uh, than string floss. Um, and the problem with string floss around teeth is that most people don't use it correctly. Um, I grew up in Romania, so we didn't have string floss. And of course, I paid the price for it. We didn't have a water jet either. So uh, when I came here, I went to dental school. Then I really understood what, what's the point of flossing. is really to get the bacteria from in between the teeth. The problem is most people just put the floss in and out very quickly without wrapping it around like a C around each tooth. And the people that actually do that and wrap around the floss like a C front and back, you know, wiggle it, and pull it out. Yeah, it's like probably 1%. So in comes the water flosser. It cleans all the way around the tooth, especially people that have crowns and veneers. Uh, there's special attachments that you can actually clean safely because plaque likes to gather at the edges where you can't easily reach it. Uh, crowns or veneers, for example. Uh, so what a lot of my patients, I have them do, okay, so I use a string floss and after you're done, use a water flosser. You will still get food out. And we see this I, all the time. I love it. I love you. And now, yes. Oh, Thank I you. love you too, Deborah. <laughs> Oh, because I always feel guilty. So I don't know if anybody else listening has this experience, but I I can now admit I don't floss all that often unless I have an appointment scheduled like in the very near future. I'm sure you never hear this. And you know, right? Because they come yeah. to your office and you make them bleed because they're not conditioned. They haven't been doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have to tell you what I do. I'll share. I'm happy to share. Yeah, I use a water flosser most of the time. Awesome. For me, that's sufficient. Um, we mm -hmm. have people that have bigger teeth and, you know, very, very tight spaces. You know, you can barely get the floss in. But those are, unfortunately, the people that also should floss more regularly. But for mm -hmm. most people, I would say a water flosser is more effective than using string floss. Interesting. Okay. I love it. Love, yes. love, love. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll be happy I'm, to send you a water flosser. And try it out. Oh gosh, well, so, I have one. I do oh, have one because I'm I'm much more inclined to use it. It just feels a little more novel and fun. I think, yes. but also just more comfortable. Yeah, and you know all yeah. the studies. We there's been a lot of studies on the actual water flosser, and um, um, what we do know is that great at reducing inflammation. And all the studies were done just with water. You don't have to add anything in it, just water. Great. Awesome. I'm, I'm so good. Okay. So we've touched on so many things that I want to ask you about. So I'm going to start diving into those. So mentioning veneers and a lot of, a lot of our listeners probably have them. Will they, will they wear out? Do they have a limited lifespan when they need to be replaced? Great question. Um, the newer dental material, so let's say you're getting in veneers in the last uh, maybe four years or so, uh, the new materials are a lot more durable long term. Uh, now, every 10 years, looking at the older veneers, we say about every 10 to 15 years, if it's been that long, you should replace them. 
Yeah. Also, the porcelain is so much more alive today. They're a lot better. But if you do decide to get veneers, you have to remember that, you know, we have to shave the tooth. So from a biological perspective, every time we shave the tooth, there's trauma to the tooth. So mm-hmm. I would recommend that people who don't have veneers that maybe are saying, oh, you know, I just want them whiter or, you know, maybe try a whitening first. Mm-hmm. See how that is for you. Yeah. Before you go to veneers. And uh, just I can say that is also trauma if you happen to look in the mirror and you see your shaved tooth. That's going to send you into trauma. Oh my gosh. I never, never need to see that again. (laughs) Uh, Yes. Yes. That's hard. Okay. So back to flossing and a little bit of this, we didn't, we didn't actually say it, but it definitely made me think about this. Is there a natural solution for receding gums or once they recede, is that just it? What can be done? That's another great question because I'm a periodontist. So you're asking the right question for Good. me. <laughs> um, you know, as we, uh, as we get older, definitely there's a thinning, not just in the gums, but there's a thinning in the skin, uh, a thinning of the bone. And, and that's all related to collagen. So I am a big fan of collagen supplementation, not just for beauty. A lot of the studies were done for for the beauty industry, but also for supporting the bone and the gums. So I highly recommend, I think, to any woman over 40 to get on collagen supplementation and collagen peptides specifically. And there are just so many of them on the market today. Um, me, what I do, I actually like to uh, take a scoop of collagen and uh, peptides and put it in my coffee in the morning. Uh, it's tasteless. I, I don't even feel it. You can put it in soup, you can put it in tea and anything, but it's such a great way to incorporate collagen peptides for, for more resilient gum tissue and bone. Love it. And to all the smoothie girls listening, just adding that collagen. Remember, the collagen alone is not the kind of protein that you need for your muscle, but you can add it to it. Love it. Yes. Great. So, and and going back one, uh, to, to the receding gums, the best, especially for those of you that have thinner gums, definitely don't overbrush and, uh, using a water jet is gentler, um, than actually using floss around, around thin receding gums. Great. Okay. Super helpful. So, I guess my my next question was more of an analogy and and probably a very hopeful question. If you cannot tell, I have some receding gums. But uh, it's all about me today. Uh, <laughs> so we we encourage women to lift weights, for instance. Heavier weights are going to have a bigger push, a bigger stimulus and stress on the bone. So the bone responds even after a certain point in time, even after menopause. We've now seen this, especially with women who might be doing hormone replacement. We've still seen the bone come back, push back and regain some density. Is the same true of receding gums if you're flossing or taking good care or using the water flosser that it absolutely. may come back or not? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's and the I answer see- I wanted. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And you know what's interesting? <laughs> With the water flosser, um, I, I like to use the analogy of, you know, when you get, I don't know if you've ever gotten a hydrofacial. Yeah. But essentially, it's a facial. They use a water pressure, like a water pulsation over the face because that stimulates collagen. So I'm a firm believer that the same, the water flosser does the same for the gums, kind of like a hydrofacial for the face. That that pulsation of the water against the collagen fiber fibers, it makes them more resilient. Awesome. So, Yeah. Definitely. We do see that. So we need to exercise a little bit the teeth and gums and the same with people, you know, who are missing teeth. And if you're not going to exercise that bone with chewing, you're going to see a loss of bone. That was my next question. So very intuitive because you kind of talked about loss of bone and of course in the jaw and the teeth. Okay. So speak to that. Talk about chewing and the importance of it. Absolutely. And chewing like fibrous foods. Mm -hmm. A lot of us, you know, especially if you have a toothache or, you know, you're, you're 
teeth are sensitive, you might get away from fibrous foods, foods that are harder, uh, but that's not necessarily a good thing. So you want to have, you know, I like a lot of fiber in my diet, like fresh vegetables. You can actually chew and put that stress over the bone in order to maintain the bone density of the jaw. One of the things we're seeing, especially, um, you know, with women, they say they've lost some teeth and now they're not using their back bone to chew with. They're chewing most of their food in the front. We're definitely seeing a droopiness of the face. Uh, the muscle atrophies because you're no longer working it out it's just like you would any other muscle. You're not chewing on it anymore. So the muscle gets atrophied and droopy and the jaw, you get the sunken in look of the jaw. And this also relates to, you know, people that maybe have some kind of removable type of prosthesis or removable, um, some removable teeth in the back. You're not able to put as much pressure on the bone and, and as much uh, pressure tension on the muscles. So uh, you're definitely going to notice a loss. So the best way, if you are missing teeth, I highly encourage you to look into dental implants because it will help to put that tension on the bone again and on the muscles to maintain it. Very cool. Okay. I have to ask this. And as a smoothie girl and someone who actually promotes that for, you know, once a day, you know, to get in an extra serving of protein post post uh, workout or as a breakfast, which often I use it for, it, there is such a I don't, commodity right now for smoothies and shakes and two shakes a day and then one meal at night. Are we seeing, and, and is it even possible for you to answer this? I may be putting you on the spot here, but it, over time, collectively, there are a lot of people doing more liquid meals, feeling somehow that is a way to lose weight or sustain it or make it convenient to eat. Are we seeing more and more of this? And do you think it's related? That's interesting. I, I haven't seen any research to show that if we do more liquid meals, um, mm -hmm. we lose more bone or uh, have more gum disease on the teeth. One thing I can tell you is um, what I'm seeing is like if somebody has smoothies with a lot of fruit, I'm mm -hmm. definitely seeing more plaque accumulating yeah. on the teeth because fruit is still sugar. Yep. Amen. And when you, yeah, when you don't you want have to say that, that again, fiber, just, just fruit go is ahead. Sugar. <laughs> fruit is sugar and it's still not healthy, even though it's natural, but it's still sugar. So, so um, what we do see that, let's say if you eat the fruit, mm -hmm. um, that fiber, let's say an apple, right? The fibers in the apple will have to clean the plaque over your teeth. But if you're going to have applesauce, you're going to get the plaque, but not the ability to actually, you know, clean the teeth. And you end up eating a lot more apples and applesauce than if you were to eat an apple. Great point. Such a great point. <laughs> oh, okay. So gosh, you have done such a great job of answering all of my questions and you segued or you led right to them. So I've got one more thing. and. Absolutely. We, we, I think, have touched on this just right now, so it's perfect segue. It's There's a little ESP going on here today. So I'm guessing that nutrition for optimal oral health overall goes beyond not eating sticky sweets. And, and even as you've mentioned, you know, a natural sweet higher in micronutrient density still can be problematic. What other recommendations do you have or mistakes you see most commonly happening? That's a great topic, Deborah, because you're right. It goes beyond sticky, like not eating sticky foods. What are foods that are healthy for your mouth? Uh, and I'm a big fan of probiotic foods in general. And uh, for those of you who are interested in bake-free probiotic recipes, we have some on uh, um, orasana.com. Uh, any kind of probiotic. So I'm not talking about just yogurt, but let's say sauerkraut or kimchi, or there's a lot of good coconut-based yogurts out there. You can ferment pretty much any vegetable. And that fermentation process, uh, the probiotics in the foods are so beneficial 
for the entire GR, GI tract, not just for the mouth. But you know, remember, the mouth is the opening of the GI tract. When we have healthy bacteria in the mouth, we do see healthier gums, stronger teeth, a more alkaline saliva, more alkaline pH. Uh, this is very, very important. The more acidic the pH in the mouth is from eating the sticky sweets, uh, fruit, fruit juice, uh, fruit smoothies, this acidity in the mouth actually will cause the enamel to wear down faster. And we're going to age our teeth a lot faster by eating acidic foods. So incorporating things like, uh, you know, dark leafy greens with a lot of calcium, um, those are the ones that are more alkaline forming so that you're going to keep the saliva in your mouth. And it's an easy way to test the pH saliva. And you can learn more about it in my book. Uh, it's called Heal Up. Um, it's it's something that's important for overall health, but also important for oral health by testing the pH. Love it. And we've talked a little bit about alkalinity, but of course, never in the realm of oral health. So thanks for mentioning that again. By the way, listeners, we'll have the link to Sanda's website where you'll find the book Heal Up and her bake-free probiotic recipes. That'll be in the show notes. So don't worry if you're working out, keep keep going. <laughs> if you're driving, <laughs> don't right. do not try to write while you're doing that. Okay, <laughs> Sanda, I saved the best for last. And um, this question, of course, I have a hopeful hopeful answer. But I'm really very curious about this because I've been seeing some posts, some information that suggests this. And I want to know, is it really possible to heal a cavity without a feeling naturally? That is the best question of the hour, Deborah, for sure. <laughs> Give me the best answer, please. <laughs> yes. And uh, from a biological perspective, let's look at what teeth are. Teeth are organs. This is very important. So when you're talking about a liver, right, the liver can regenerate. Kidneys mm -hmm. can regenerate. Anything that's alive can regenerate. Therefore, so can teeth if they're alive. So what do I mean by that? If you get a cavity on a tooth that has a root canal, a tooth mm -hmm. with a root canal is no longer alive and it won't be able to heal. Um. For that reason, in biological dentistry, we, we try to save teeth to keep them alive. We're not quick about doing root canals at all for this reason. But if you have a tooth, let's say, that's just getting a cavity and you don't have a filling on it, it's just in the initial uh, incipient stages, that cavity can be reversed. And... How do we reverse it? Well, number one, definitely changing the diet, creating a more alkaline environment. Uh, during a, a, when we have a more alkaline environment for the mouth, what we do is we add nano-calcium toothpaste, and there's some great brands out there that I like. Uh, Boca is one of them, B-O-K-A. Um, the nano-calcium uh, can actually penetrate into the tooth itself, and that tooth can use the calcium to put it back in its structure. So uh, yes, we can absolutely reverse the cavities when they're in the incipient stages. And uh, we've done it in our practice many times. Uh, we use ozone, which is ozone nowadays, you can use it in form of water. And why do we like to use ozone is because it can sterilize that particular portion of the tooth. Uh, cavities are caused by cavity forming bacteria. So again, those strobal probiotics are so important to help reverse the balance from cavity causing to a healthier mouth. And then we add the nano calcium once we created a better environment in the mouth and the tooth will heal. It typically takes about four to six months. And how do we visualize this? On x-rays. The hardest part, I have to tell you, Deborah, is changing habits. Uh, <laughs> having people floss, you know, and uh, just like it is in, in exercising. And, and, no uh, kidding. Yeah, it's <laughs> hard to change habits. Yeah. Okay. So I want to honor your time. but. Um, I have one last question. And and this is every woman listening for herself, but also maybe her partner, significant other, brother, loved one. 
it, at this point, when we're talking about oral health and we're talking about midlife and beyond changes, are men and women similar in terms of our oral health status and needs, or is there are there gender differences? That's a great question. And I have to tell you the biggest difference that I see with hormonal changes in the mouth, Mm -hmm. or not in the mouth, but in the body. But what I see in the mouth is that women are more prone to um, dry mouth than men with hormonal changes, unfortunately. And also, they're more prone to a condition called burning mouth syndrome. And uh, burning mouth syndrome is exactly that. You have this like Velcro-like in the mouth. You know, I feel like your whole mouth is burning and that has to do with the estrogen drop. So I don't see these kind of things in men so much. Yes, men can get dry mouth too, but not at the rate that I see um, women getting it. Grateful for that answer. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Your website, let's say that again and talk just a little about the goodies that they'll find there because not every woman listening can drop into your office in Beverly Hills. So how can you help them if that's not a possibility? So uh, if you have any other questions, definitely you can go on Instagram and message me. I would love to uh, post any kind of interesting information that's interesting to you. Uh, orasana.com, O-R-A-S-A-N-A.com. It's a site that we post a lot of education, not just uh, uh, the natural oral product line. Um, And I encourage you to uh, go in and look at some of the articles that I wrote and really kind of educate yourself on how to practice prevention at home um, because of that reason. I know not all of you can come and see me. And I try to make, uh, to put out information and different uh, recipes and help you um, for those of you that uh, I cannot see on one on one basis. And what you'll find is a lot of your, you know, uh, pain points can be resolved just by changing little things at home. So good. Sanda, thank you so much for being here. You were a wealth of information. And who knew we needed you here today? Oh, it's my pleasure, Debra. And I think we're doing actually a special, if you use a code FLIPPIN50 mm-hmm. on orasana.com, mm-hmm. I think you're a list, everybody listening will get uh, 10% off. Yes, absolutely. And we'll put that in the show notes too. This is an easy one to remember, however, right, everybody? FLIPPIN50, <laughs> you got it, right? <laughs> Tell me you do. All right. And for the show notes where you'll find where to connect with Sanda, the website, and um, her YouTube channel, as well as her Instagram. We'll link to all of those. Have that special coupon code for you for the chewable probiotics. We've got it all, and that will be at flipping50.com forward slash oral health. And what are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 today. 